Well, we uh, wrapped up Genesis last week, and um, we'll be tackling another book of the Bible probably at the other end. Uh, but between now and then, uh, I'm going to take a few weeks and focus on on um, the character of God, just aspects of the character of God revealed in Scripture. Kind of topical, but we'll still unpack some uh, specific Scripture passages. Um, so to do that this morning, we're going to talk about the holiness of God. Isaiah 6, um, I think the bulletin says verses 1 through 8. I just want to take it to verse 7. So you can turn there, and I will lead us in prayer before we uh, get to reading it together. I'll do that in a few moments. Let's pray. This, um, this word that lies open before us, this book, Father, your book, the Bible, it is our daily bread, and it is more to us, more needful to us than even the, the bread and the meat that we eat. This word is food for our souls, awakening us to life in Jesus and continuing to work on us to sustain us in that glorious relationship that we have as being your children. So God, we're asking right now that you would give us that attentiveness in mind and, and an expectation that we're going to hear from you. And Lord, that you would use a mere man to do that, that, uh, that your words would transcend mine, and that in the end uh, of this, Christ himself would be glorified among us. And so we ask it all in his name. Amen. Uh, just imagine with me if you've been invited to some kind of social gathering or, or an event, like a, like a wedding, um, and some of the people you, there, you know them well, and in all likelihood, they, those that you know well, will introduce you to people that you don't know. And so, for example, just a painting a scenario here, your friend brings, brings you over to her older sister. You've never met her. She lives in another state. She says, hey, this is my friend, Teresa. You'd really get along. She's really into gardening, and she's got four wonderful children. Now, that introduction might be fine, except your name is not Teresa, and you've killed every plant you've ever tried to tend to this point in your life, and you're unmarried and have never had children. Even nice things said about you, if not remotely true, I think would be dishonoring, and I think you'd agree. Now, I know, it's an absurd illustration. It likely wouldn't happen. Now, I think it's true that most people assume that, that God exists. Yet, how often is God misrepresented? How often is he described in ways that bear no resemblance at all to his self-revelation? Like my absurd illustration, people have an idea of God, but think and speak about him in ways that ultimately dishonor him. And we don't want to do that, and that's the purpose of this series so that we represent God well, so that we know who we're worshiping. God is self-evident to the sentient. The Bible tells us that simply observing the created order reveals his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, and that these have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. That says that, says that in Romans 1.20. And even though general revelation leaves us without excuse, God has additionally given us his word. He wants his people to know him. So he's revealed himself in a special way to all who are willing to open the book, open his word. And so that's what I want to do over the next few weeks, taking our instruction directly from Scripture. I want to think about the very nature of God. So today, we're going to explore what it means that God is holy. And so as I mentioned our scripture passage this morning, I want us to give our attention to Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 7. So I encourage you to follow along in your own Bible. Hopefully you've turned there by now. Isaiah 6, 1 through 7. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, 
Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. As we look at this passage of Scripture together this morning, I, I want us to focus on the holiness of God. And we see that word explicitly in the text. But that God is holy, I want you to see that it means that he is exalted. And what that implies is a, a, a comparative difference of station, position. That God is holy, secondly, means that he is wholly other, implying a difference of quality, even kind. And that God is holy means that he radiates glory implying an aesthetic difference, a matter of beauty. God is exalted, God is wholly other, and that he radiates glory. And that's what I'm, where I'm going this morning. First, the seraphim reveal that God is exalted. God is exalted. It's no mystery to you, American citizens, in this form of government that we have here, there is a great respect for the office of the president. The office of the president is above the station of regular citizens. We get that. It's an exalted position by order of tradition and the Constitution. It's been established, of course, by a majority vote of electors. The president, being an exalted place, lives in a special house, unlike any other house. He has a special song when he enters the room. He is driven in a special car. He has a special airplane, a special helicopter, and he gets special privileges of pardon, unlike anyone else in the nation. That is significant power. And you know this. If you should happen to get an audience with the president, you would not say today, hey, how you doing, Joe? Good to see you. No, you would address him as Mr. President. Now, of course, we're under no illusions here. As much as we are hopeful for something better every four or eight years, the man occupying the office is not nearly as dignified as the office itself. And I mean no specific disrespect. We just observe that across the history of every single president. The individual occupying the office is never as dignified as the office itself. There have been or are philanderers, cheats, liars, panders, self-indulgent, self-serving men. We have seen that. But we pray for them. But in our minds, we separate the office of the president from the man or potentially woman who may occupy it. But as our text reveals, God and his station are inseparable because in God's essence, he is highly exalted, not just because he occupies a place of exaltation. He is highly exalted. And there is an infinite difference of station between God and man. Now, the prophet here is given this vision of the Lord. And what does he see? We see this in the text. He says, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Now, this is a vision. He didn't actually see God, but this is his vision of seeing God. Now, this throne, it's a seat of honor. We get it. It's a place where there is authority. It's also high, meaning extolled. It's lofty, set on high, and it's lifted up. It's, it is an exalted place. This is who God is is he is exalted and god of course occupies that place of honor because of his eternal nature this is what psalm 39 tells us that he is all knowing right he discerns the psalmist says my thoughts from afar he knows what i'm thinking there isn't anything he doesn't know the psalmist also says that he is ever present he says where shall i go from from your spirit if i'll go in the grave you're there if i go up to heaven you're there it doesn't matter where i go you are there and all we have to do is look back at the creation narrative and see and conclude that, that God is all-powerful, that he, he accomplishes his purposes simply by speaking. 
King David prayed this before the people. We see this in 1 Chronicles. He says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. God, our Lord God, is highly exalted. That's what the seraphim were declaring. Now, that God is holy means that he holds that, is, that exalted place far above all creation. He is outside of creation. He's not subject to it. He is outside of it. He acts upon it. He put it in place. It didn't exist apart from God. And because of his power, because of his exalted place, what that means is that he is worthy of honor, praise, and adoration. He is worthy. In fact, to deny God praise and adoration and acknowledge his worth is to live a lie, is to speak a lie. The very fact of God and who he is in, ex in his exalted place demands the truth be declared that he is exalted above all. We're commanded in the Psalms. Psalm 29, 2. The psalmist says, Ascribe to the Lord glory to his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. If you're a believer in Jesus today, if, if you acknowledge who God is, worship of God in his holiness, that's, that's not optional. It's not optional. Jesus said as much to a woman he met at a well, a Samaritan woman. He said to her when she asked some theological questions about the right place to worship, he said to her, True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now, that's a fact. If you want to worship rightly, it's going to be in spirit and truth. But he, then he says this, For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. God is seeking. When He looks at you, does He see a worshiper? that God is holy, that he is high and exalted, demands that we, just to live in truth, acknowledge that. God is God being highly exalted and lift, lifted up. We, if we rightly understand how God has revealed himself, we have to then live our lives in a humble recognition of God's worth to be constantly acknowledged for who he is. And so we must be careful not to worship God in any way that diminishes him or makes him, maybe in our own minds, more accessible or tangible. You know, that was the error of the Israelites. You know, when Moses went up to the mountain, Mount Sinai, to receive the law, when Moses tarried, Aaron, his brother, made a carved image. And he had the people worship it. Perhaps you recall what he said. He said about the calf, Behold, your God who brought you out of Egypt. He said, Let's make God accessible. Here, just use the calf. I made it. No. It's idolatry. God was diminished by that, made into an image of a calf. How utterly horrifically dishonoring to the Lord. Our worship must never bring God down. We must always recognize him in his exalted place. The, the writer of Hebrews says, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. Now there's a kind of worship. There's a kind of worship that is, that is marked by a life of gospel obedience. That's Romans 12 too. And I don't want to take anything away from that. The Apostle Paul says this is your, you know, lay your lives down as a, as a living sacrifice. This is your spiritual worship. And it is. A mark life by, by gospel obedience is certainly an expression of worship. But, so I'm not taking anything away from that. But do not set aside the importance of giving expression to our worship of him in the assembly of God's people to be sure and anywhere else we might be. The only way to worship God in spirit and in truth 
is to acknowledge that it is only through Christ. It is only through Christ that our worship is even acceptable to God. So if you have not looked to Christ in faith, your worship of God is devoid of truth. So let me say this. Sorry, Jews and Muslims who say you worship the God of Abraham. If you have ignored Abraham's anointed offspring, the Christ, Jesus, you are in error. Again, from Hebrews, through him, that is Christ, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. That God is holy means that he is exalted and it demands our worship. Secondly, we see from the vision of the prophet that God is holy other. Note the homonym there, holy. That is to say, completely, absolutely, in every sense, something, someone other, someone else. He is holy other. Now, distinction and discrimination. Those are very related words. Distinction is the recognition of the way that one thing is not like another. Discriminating is acting on that knowledge. So, for example, if you're looking to hire someone to work as a teller in your bank, you're going to rightly understand that there is a distinction between someone who has consistently been a law-abiding citizen of the town and someone recently released from a state prison who served a sentence for grand theft. You get it. So if you're hiring someone to work as a teller in your bank, this is wise to discriminate, right? Making distinctions is necessary for life. And understanding that God is distinct, utterly, absolutely other from us, this is what our text reveals about God. There is a quality distinction. It is moral. It is a distinction of kind. So we see in the prophet's vision that he sees the Lord exalted in the place of honor. And the reason that the Lord has that place of honor is because of what the seraphim does. Okay, so these creatures, what the seraphim does and then what the prophet hears. So as a result, the prophet understands the distinction. He understands the otherness of God and then he acts accordingly. Look at verse 2. Above him, that is the Lord, who is high and exalted, lifted up on a throne. His robe fills the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. One called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Now, I was tempted to explore what these creatures are, but I'm not going to spend any time trying to figure that out. What is important, I think, for our purposes this morning is what these creatures do. And we see they need a couple of wings to remain airborne. But with a pair of wings, they cover their faces. And with another pair, they cover their feet. I take it that these creatures, these seraphim, they understand the distinction between what they are and who God is is and it's revealed in their posture and what they communicate by their posture they boldly declare so one of them called to another and said holy 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 is the lord of hosts so let's look at that word holy i mean i've said that the focus of this message is the holiness of god god is holy that word holy the hebrew word behind it kadosh means set apart other or of a different moral quality. And that the seraphim say it three times, what that does is it implies the superlative. So not merely, not simply morally good as some declarative, not simply better as a comparative, right? But of a quality that is infinitely above all creatures, all creation, the superlative. That God is thrice Holy means that he is holy other. W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy, completely, entirely, absolutely, eternally, undeniably other. 
That is who God is. And that otherness has terrifying implications for creatures. See those seraphim? They do not even behold him with their eyes. They cover their face. And in his presence, there is not even the remotest sense of presumption and they cover their feet. They're acting in a way to discriminate, to recognize the moral difference between creature, us, and creator. They need to be there. They've, they're in this vision. They need to be there to make that declaration, but only, only with a sense of profound reverence. That is a vision, but, but the Apostle Paul backs this up when, when he's instructing Timothy, helping him prepare to be a pastor and to be most effective in that role. He exhorts Timothy, look, you've got to, to maintain a life of purity. And he describes the reason why. He said, describes God as the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in, get this, unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. The light is unapproachable because God's infinite moral purity is so powerful, so utterly devastating to anything remotely and even in the tiniest sense impure because that thing would immediately be consumed with judgment. And at the declaration of God's otherness, creature saying to the other, the very foundations of the temple in this vision cannot stand under the terror of this truth. Verse 4, and the foundations of the threshold shook, shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Now, in this vision, Isaiah gets this. Notice in the vision that the Lord says nothing at all. There's no words coming from the Lord. But the prophets know. The prophet knows this. He doesn't actually see God. Again, this is a vision. But what he is seeing in his vision is what he believes in that vision to be God. And his response, look at that. His response, he gets what's going on here. Verse 5, Woe is me, I am lost, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. That's, I know it's old language. Woe is me. It doesn't sound that ominous, maybe we haven't studied this like oh too bad for me where do I turn but really it's more akin to I'm doomed I'm condemned I will be obliterated and why be because Isaiah knows the law right he knows that in Exodus thirty three twenty, the Lord said to Moses you cannot see my face for no man shall see me and live. That's what Paul echoed to Timothy. That God lives in unapproachable light. So even in the vision, the prophet feels the devastation of seeing God and he utters what he, he is convinced are perhaps his very last words. Now, of course, if we didn't know the story, at this point we would expect the prophet to be destroyed, but he's not. His response to the terrifying otherness of God is to immediately understand his own absolute, complete depravity, how utterly far away in character he is from God in his otherness. Verse 5, For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Unclean lips. What does he mean by that? It's, it's the lips that give expression to the content of the heart. So it's not that he's just admitting to some naughty words. No, he, what he understands is that he is corrupted and he lives among corrupt people and the uncleanness of his lips are the thoughts and attitudes that lead to actions opposed to God and his declared truth. He gets that this is me. I'm a living 
lie. And that expression is an admission before God. It's a repentance before God. And then we see something wonderful happens here. God doesn't leave him in his woeful state. Verse 6, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin atoned for. So this is a vision of the temple where in the vision he sees the Lord. And so that temple, of course, includes an altar of sacrifice. But I want you to notice his sin is not atoned for. It is not covered by the prophet's own confession. Rather, it is an act of God to send the seraphim to him to touch his lips. It's a vision. It's full of symbolism. That purifying coal touches his lips. The coal from the altar of sacrifice. In the temple worship, I will say this. The animals slaughtered and burned. Those routine sacrifices, they, they didn't actually remove the guilt of the worshiper. We learn this from Hebrews 10, verse 4. The writer there says, It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And yet, the prophet is declared forgiven. But those sacrifices in the Old Covenant, they served really as a placeholder. What they did was they pointed forward to a day when Jesus, as it says again in Hebrews, entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. You see, in, in this vision, the, the prophet was made holy by a divine act of grace. And brothers and sisters in Christ, we, you and I, are made holy in the presence of God by a singular act of divine grace. That is, God sending His one and only Son to become a man, to offer up His own perfect, sinless body as a sacrifice of atonement. And like the prophet, we are justified before God by that act of grace. And that grace continues. That grace has the power in our lives to actualize holiness in us. And we're going to see how in a moment. But understand this. If you're a child of God, His will for you, because He is holy, is for you to be holy. God wants you and me to be holy. He says this in the law, you shall be holy, Leviticus 19, 2. Why? For I, the Lord your God, am holy. If you are my people, therefore you reflect my character. God has not relaxed his will for the new covenant people of God. Because you have believed in the Son of God and have been made a child of God, we're instructed, New Testament, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Now, if you see, as I hope you do, the distinction, the moral distinction between you and God, the only response, the only response is to acknowledge I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among people of unclean lips. God, I am corrupted. Before your holiness, I'm filthy. And when you acknowledge that, recognizing the holiness of God, He sends the seraphim to take that coal from the fire and touch your lips, figuratively speaking. When you acknowledge his holiness, he opens your eyes 
to the Son of God, the perfect Son of God, crucified on the cross for you. And when you trust Him, He declares, your sins are forgiven. Atonement is accomplished. Well, third, because God is holy, He radiates glory. He radiates glory. Maybe you've, you might have said this. I think we say this a lot, but people say beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Lots of people say that, especially when you see something that you, somebody thinks is great and you go, yeah, so beauty is in the eye of the beholder, <laughs> right? I suppose that there are some things subjectively beautiful. And to me, I, I would like to think these are objectively beautiful, but to me, the aurora borealis, you know, the northern lights, if you see those, it's just, you can't not look. Or for me, you know, hearing Handel's Messiah, that, that, that chorus with a full orchestra and choir, it usually makes me cry. The beauty to my ears. From a taste perspective, a Wagyu, <laughs> a Wagyu uh, prime um, uh, um, steak. Sorry, I'm trying to describe which cut. Ribeye. Or, you know, maybe cinnamon buns fresh out of the oven. <laughs> like th these things, there's, there's a experiential beauty, right? These sights, sounds, tastes, smells, they're beautiful, even glorious. But here, as I've, as I've thought about this, as I've thought about things that are glorious, as I've thought about beauty, I, I've become increasingly convinced that true beauty, that which is truly glorious, is that which most closely approximates what God makes and what God does. And so when we experience God's works, when we see and understand God's words, when we understand and see God's plans unfolding, these things, they are truly and uniquely glorious. And they're glorious because they're so very compelling. The seraphim in, in this, they declare, after they say the holiness of God, thrice holy, the whole earth is full of his glory. The whole earth is full of his glory. So what's glory? How do we use that word? That, that Hebrew word behind it, kavod. Literally, it's heaviness, right? But the synonyms you see in the scripture could be splendor, dignity, abundance, even riches. Now notice that the seraphim do not say that God is glorious, but that the old, whole earth is full of his glory. And I, I know I risk being pedantic here, but I think the glory is not some aspect of God. But think with me. I think it's the, the experiential effect of what he does on creatures. Glory is the experiential effect on creatures. For example, the psalmist writes, the heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. So you know this, right? You look up in the sky, you look at the planets, uh, you observe the galaxies, and finite as they are, and they are, a lifetime is not enough to grasp the wonder of it all. God made it. That's why it declares his glory. It's so beautiful to behold. It fascinates us. You could spend a lifetime just staring through a telescope and you would never st stop discovering if you had the capability. The sense of awe when you see things like that. You, you can't and, and you don't want to look away. You're, you're drawn in. Another example, when, when Solomon dedicated the, the, the newly constructed temple in Jerusalem, we're told there in 2 Chronicles, the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. And I can imagine, while the priests could not go in to the temple, I can imagine standing there and just looking at the wonder of it all with awe. So when you look at creation, when you marvel at its expanse, when, when, you, when you see the intricacies and the beauty of it, you feel this sense of awe, right? You want to 
see. You want to be drawn in. You are drawn in. And when, when God uniquely manifests himself, that it, his presence, the, the, the splendor, the importance, the wonder of who he is in some tangible or experiential way, you want to be there. It's glorious. Now, now think about this. You can think of a myriad of examples of, of ways that you think something is like amazing and you want to look at it, right? Maybe it's just observing the Grand Canyon or, a, or in a sports play, right? Watching college football. Did you see that catch? Right? And you'll talk about it for the next several weeks. Did you see that catch? His foot was just inside. Well, whatever. If you're not a football fan, for me it's hockey. It's like, did you see how he passed the puck? Or in music rehearsal on Thursday night when, when we work together on our harmonies and we, we sing in such a way, we go, oh, well, to us, boy, that sounded good. Now, now bragging, but then, of course, we listen to the recording. It isn't as good as we thought it was. But either way, either way, there was something glorious about it. And we, we routinely celebrate that kind of stuff, don't we? How much more, how much more is God glorious? In his holiness, there's this infinitely higher aesthetic, this, this beauty of his works over ours. This infinite otherness in the beauty and the glory of God. The way God works, the things that he does, the fulfilling of his plans, it's glorious. And if your spiritual eyes have been opened, you don't want to look away. You want to be where God's glory is manifested this verse three again, the seraphim declare, the whole earth is full of his glory. Well, how? How how is that true? Now we could talk about creation. We can come up with countless examples of God's common grace that we observe all the time. But I want to say this the most the most compelling thing, the most glorious thing that God has ever done since the creation of the world, perhaps obscured to the prophet, seeing this vision, right? But very clear to us. It was revealed in God sending his son into the world to rescue his own from condemnation. That is glorious. Jesus said it. Anticipating the cross before him, he said this to his disciples. Hear his words. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be injured, hurt, killed. He said, glorified. Glorified. How is there glory in suffering? How is there glory in such a, a cruel and horrific punishment? He understood the eternal beauty and glory of what he was accomplishing. He endured the cross, despising the shame. He understood what he was accomplishing. And listen, when the Holy Spirit awakens you from your spiritual deadness and you see the cross of Christ for the beautiful act of mercy and grace that it is, you don't want to look away. It, it's why that old hymn writer, tell me the old, old story, Jesus and his cross. Or turn my eyes to Jesus. Turn your eyes to Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the earthly things will become strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Another hymn, sorry, I'm just quoting hymns here, but, but this one, even as I, I thought about the, the glory, yes, the glory of the cross, Stuart Town in, in the hymn, we often sing how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. And then acknowledging the sin and sinfulness, ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath brought me life. I know that it is finished. Something absolutely amazing happens when we see, when we hear 
the gospel. It's glorious. It is infinitely glorious. The Apostle Paul, in explaining this glory, and this is how it affects us in our lives, he, he gives this illustration of Moses going up to Sinai and getting the law and how the Israelites couldn't, couldn't really understand the glory in the law. And he talks about the law, how it was a ministry of death. But now there, in Christ, there's this, there's this understanding of all that God was doing. And then he says this in 2 Corinthians 3, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And he says this, and we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. When you keep the beauty of the cross of Christ in constant view, over time, that glory changes you to become more like Christ in character, more holy, more godly in character. That's what the psalmist says. This is experiential, brothers and sisters. It's, it's not, just, not just facts. Feel it. It's glorious. The psalmist says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And, and, and so you've got to do this. Not physically do this, but in your mind. Look around the room. See how the glory of the Lord fills the earth. We are people of unclean lips, whose sins have been atoned for. Former adulterers, drug addicts, cheats, liars, abusers, prideful, arrogant, hopeless and helpless, filthy enemies of God. You've seen His holiness. You've experienced His forgiveness. And now you can continue to behold the glory of the Lord. And as you do that, you increasingly display the glory of the Lord. God is a holy God, high and exalted. He is holy other. And all his works are glorious. That is the God we worship. There's this infinite distance of station between us and God. So, so worship Him. Take every opportunity to, to think of and dwell on and share His goodness. There's an infinite difference of moral quality between man and God. And by the cross of Christ, if you have believed in Jesus, the Son of God, and what He's accomplished for you, you have been set apart and declared holy. So, in all you do, imitate Him. And lastly, God radiates glory. We get to see beautiful things all the time and delight in them, but, but more than anything, we need to see what radiates from God and His glory primarily in the cross of Christ. So, what does that mean? Enjoy Him. Enjoy Him. Let's pray. God, You're a holy God. And I pray that even as we've experienced the immeasurable grace of for you, in spite of the fact that we're unclean people, for you to cause our sin to be atoned by your son's sacrifice. God, would you move us to worship you as we ought, to seek to imitate your character in everything that we do. And Father, that your desire for us is to enjoy you. Help us to be those people. And that is ultimately all for your glory. We ask it through Christ. Amen.